five in a year. The last one. Christmas morning. I've been waiting for this. There she is. My mama calls this one the God present. That means it's got to be. Well, here we go. Moment of truth. Well, I don't smell it. Jesus in it. But John's gospel says, in the beginning was the Word. 
And the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and He was with God in the beginning. And perhaps the most powerful Christmas verse ever is this one. For God so loved the world, He gave <coughs> His only begotten Son. You know, this tells us a little bit about God, doesn't it? It tells us that God is a God who shows us what His love looks like. He's a God who so loved the world, He gave. So God does not just give by creating the universe and hanging the stars in the sky. God does not just tell us about His love uh, in His Word that He gives us. God does not just uh, give His love that He gives us health and air to breathe and food to wear, uh, food to eat and clothes to wear. God does not just give His love and that He causes the, the world to teem with life and power and energy. But God so loved the world, He gives Himself. He gives His Son, Jesus. And it's a very powerful verse. And it's one of the few verses in Scripture that you can really just lift it completely out of context and preach it. And it'll preach all on its own. Can I get an amen? amen. Uh, it tells you about who God is. It tells you about Jesus. It tells you about the exchange that happens uh, for us to get eternal life. But it becomes even more powerful. When we understand it in the context of the Gospel of John in the third chapter. Because it's there that, that Jesus has this encounter with a guy named Nicodemus. And Nicodemus is a leader and a teacher in the church. He's a Pharisee. He's got all the learned wisdom and the knowledge. And he's been through the process and the protocol. But obviously something is missing in Nicodemus' life because he comes and he seeks out Jesus. Nicodemus makes a good first step, right? Because the, the essential thing that we need to do in our lives, the most important thing that we'll ever do, is that we seek out Jesus. Can I get an amen? Yeah. And that's what Nicodemus does, but he does it by cover of night. So Nicodemus doesn't necessarily want his colleagues to know that he's going to Jesus, because that could ruin his reputation, that could maybe even cost him his life. So Nicodemus comes to Jesus anonymously, by cover of night, and he says to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher, who has come from God. For no one can do the signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Now last week we talked about the, the two different kinds of knowing and the two different kinds of sight. Uh, we talked about the difference between what we can see intellectually with our senses and with our minds. We talked about the eyes of the heart. The spiritual realities that are around us all the time that we have to be sensitive to and see with the eyes of faith. We talked about sometimes you've got to walk by faith and not by sight, and that God's ways are higher than our ways, and His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And sometimes God's kingdom doesn't even make any sense in a, in a rational, intellectual kind of way, right? Because a, a God in a manger uh, is something that, that's hard to, to wrap your head around. Can I get an amen? Amen. But it's God's um, spirit moving in us and our sensitivity to that spirit uh, that, that Jesus proclaims to his disciples. But Nicodemus is a guy who's caught up on the, on the far end of the, the, the mind spectrum. Nicodemus says, we see that you're something special because we see the signs and we see the works, we see the wonders that you're doing, and we know that you're a rabbi and a teacher, and you couldn't do these things if there wasn't something special about you if you weren't connected to God. But then Jesus says, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God. See, Nicodemus thinks he sees the kingdom of God, but all he sees is, is the evidence, the material facts of the kingdom of God. What's this kingdom of God business? Well, it's the central proclamation of Jesus' sermon and teaching and life. The kingdom of God is where God's will and power and grace is being carried out on the earth. An earth that's fallen and broken and marred with sin. But God sends His Son and His Spirit into the world to, to make things right. And the kingdom of God is something uh, that, that can't be seen with the eyes of your intellect or, or with simply with your mind. For no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. And the Greek word there, anothen, can mean from above or it can also mean born again. And obviously in Western Christianity we emphasize the born again part, right? We confront people with, hey, are you a born again believer? Do you need to know Jesus? Uh, but it, it can also mean born from above. Needless to say, that there needs to be this radical change in the way that we think, in the way we live, in the way we feel. 
In order to understand and to see the kingdom of God, we've got to repent. We've got to believe. We've got to go through this transformative process, this relational process with Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. And so Nicodemus says, wait a minute. How can anyone be born again after being grown old? How can a person enter into their mother's womb the second time and be born again? Now again, Nicodemus is seeing this with the eyes of reason and intellect. That this is not probable. This is illogical. How can anybody... I mean, think of the logistics of it. It's impossible, Jesus. It doesn't make any sense. And Jesus says, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God. Now, not only can you not see it, but no one can now enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. And obviously, as the church of Jesus Christ, we understand that that's an allusion to our baptisms, where we are baptized, we are washed with the water and the word and the spirit. We become new creatures in Christ Jesus when we receive him as our Lord and Savior. But there's also this physical element to this. You know, when, when a baby's born, the, the water breaks and, and uh, mama's howling and there's this process that takes place that sometimes is a downright pretty tough process. Can I get an amen? amen? Have you ever seen someone get born? And sometimes the process of our spiritual rebirth can be tough. Sometimes it can be uncomfortable. Sometimes we've got to go through some things and make some changes that are not always easy to make. And so Jesus tells Nicodemus, what is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Nicodemus, you're seeing this thing with the eyes of, of reason and logic, and, and you're never going to get it. Because there are things that are of the flesh and there are things of the spirit. And as Paul tells us, those things are often at war with each other. What is born of the flesh is flesh. What is born of the spirit is spirit. So do not be astonished that I've said to you, you must be born from above. For the wind blows where it chooses and you hear the sound of it, but you don't know where it comes or where it goes. The ruach, the pneuma, the spirit uh, moves and, and we have sensory systems. We can uh, detect it when it's here, but we can't calculate where it's going to go or what it's going to do. Amen? Amen? I can't say, hey, the Holy Spirit's about to break out over in the choir room. People are about speaking in tongues and catch on fire. Right? We can't predict what the Spirit's going to do. It's like wind. It, 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 it moves and we can sense it, but we can't pinpoint it. We can't rationalize it. We can't deduce it down to some kind of scientific formula. Can I get an amen? And Nicodemus is seeing the spirit and the spiritual things only in that light. And so Jesus tells him, so it is with everyone who's born of the spirit. We become sensitive. We begin to see with the eyes of faith and perceive God's kingdom unfolding in our lives and in the world. And Jesus says to him, Nicodemus says, wait a minute, how can this be? I don't get this. You're, you're blowing my mind here, Jesus. This doesn't make any sense. And often in Jesus' teaching, he says things like, you people, you have ears to hear and eyes to see, but yet you don't hear. Yet you don't see. He says, you Pharisees, you blind guides. You're blind, you're going to lead the people that you're leading into a pit. Jesus uses illusions like the, the, the new wine and the old wineskin. He says, essentially, I've got this new power, this new life, this new kingdom, this new energy that I want to pour into you from God's heart to yours. But you can't pour new wine into an old wineskin. Old wineskins firm up, they get hard. And new wine, in the process of expansion and fermentation, it would burst the skin. Jesus said, I got this new love, this new energy, this new life that I want to pour into you. But if I pour it into you in the rigidity of your thinking and your religiosity and the, the way that you do things, it would burst you. You got to get a new heart and a transformed mind to understand the things of God. He says, for very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know. We testify to what you've seen, but you don't receive our testimony. And Jesus is talking about two different kinds of knowing here. There's a knowing that we can do with our minds and intellects, like I say, this thing's made of wood. But then there's a knowing that's in our hearts. Something that we feel in our soul and our spirit that, that we can't always put words on. But, but there it is. And that's Christmas, isn't it? If we ever think we've got the incarnation, if we ever think we've got Christmas all figured out, we're in trouble, ladies and gentlemen. If it ever becomes commonplace to just say, oh yeah, God became flesh, we got it all figured out. That something's wrong. It should astonish us. It should cause us to sing and to dance and to overflow with joy the fact that God became flesh. Amen. Right? That doesn't make any sense. How does the God of the universe, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, this Trinity, how can 
this all-powerful, all-knowing being be contained in a baby boy in a manger. Right? It defies logic and reason and probability. And the only way we can receive that kind of truth is in our hearts and our souls. Now, this doesn't mean we need to be crazy people. Right? Well, we're not supposed to run around and be totally out of touch with reality. We need to use the, the minds that God gave us. But head without heart is chaos. And heart without head is blind. And when we bring those two together to further God's kingdom and to roll up our sleeves and make God's dream real, we're going to see powerful and amazing things. Because it's in that kind of place and in that kind of soul and that environment that the Spirit of God can move. And so I, Jesus says to Nicodemus, if I told you about earthly things and you don't believe, how am I going to tell you about the heavenly things? If you don't get this simple stuff, right? You're a teacher of Israel and you don't get these spiritual one-on-one, these are kindergarten truths, Nicodemus. But yet you're the teacher of Israel. And so he says, no one has ascended to heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Now, Nicodemus has made some good statements about Jesus. He said he's a rabbi, he's a teacher, he's doing powerful things, but he's only scratched the surface of who Jesus really is. Because there's nobody ever been like Jesus, and there will never be anybody like Jesus in the history of the universe. Because Jesus is not like Moses, who goes up to the mountain to talk to God. There's been people in the Bible who walk with God and talk with God and have a relationship with God, but there's been nobody in the history of the world that was God in the flesh. Can I get an amen? amen? He's the one who descended. He's the one who came to show us God, to reveal the Father, to put a face on Him so that we can touch Him and see Him and feel Him. He teaches us how to love. He teaches us how to think. He teaches us how to live. He teaches us what a kingdom life is like. God the Father, through the Son, comes down into earth. Amen? amen? amen. That's what Christmas is about. No one has ever ascended except the one who descended to come and make God's love real in the earth. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up so that all may have eternal life. Amen. Now you might say to yourself, wait a minute, we're on this whole born again thing and then Jesus goes to this, this Moses lifting up the serpent thing. What happened here? Right? Well, Nicodemus as a teacher of the law would be somebody who intellectually knows the scriptures well. And he would absolutely know the story of uh, the Exodus, right, in, this, in the, the book of Numbers, uh, where the people take a 40-day journey and turn into a 40-year wilderness wandering. Anybody ever take a 40-day journey and turn into a 40-year wilderness wandering? Well, that's what they do. And in the book of Numbers, they rebel against God. They sin again and again. They say, hey, we're tired of this manna stuff, God. We want some steak. We want some leeks and onions like we used to eat in Egypt. And so these poisonous snakes come into the camp of the Israelites. And they begin to bite the Israelites. And they are dying in droves. They're, they're just dying. They're reaping the consequences of their sin, their rebellion against God. And they are sitting there poisoned. And so Moses intercedes to God and says, God, what do I do? Your people are dying. And then he lifts up this bronze serpent in front of the people. Now watch this. This, the object of their wrath, the very thing that has bitten them and poisoned them, and they are dying where they stand. When they look to the bronze serpent, it stops the process of death and suspends the poison in their veins so that they can live. Now understand this. Jesus says, unless the Son of Man, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. So when Jesus Christ is lifted up on the cross, the object of our wrath, when we were yet sinners, when we were poisoned by our own deeds and our own sin and the darkness of our own hearts, the cross, ladies and gentlemen, that's what we deserve. Amen. The wages of sin is death, and all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. God said, when you eat of this fruit, you will surely die. The wages of sin is death. We deserve the cross. But when we look to Jesus Christ, who's lifted up like the serpent in the wilderness, it suspends the process of death in our bodies. It stops the poison in our veins. That when we look to Jesus Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith, our salvation, 
It reverses the process of our death and sin. When we look on the punishment that was wrought upon Him that should have made our punishment, it stops the, the, the poison of sin from flowing in our veins. Can I get an amen? amen? And it's within that context then that you get John 3.16. When a bunch of people rolling around in the wilderness dying from snake bites for their rebellion and their sin and the, the chaos of their lives. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believeth in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Now, when I think about for God so loved the world, I think God loved the world this much, right? We, we can't wrap our arms around it. But, but that's not what the verse means. For God so loved the world in this way. This is what God's love looks like. For God so loved the world. You want to know what it looks like? Here it is. He gave His only begotten Son. For God so loves the world. That's not just one little group. That's not just Jews. That's just not this group or this race or these people or that socioeconomic status. It's the whole world. And if you belong to the whole world, then God came to die for you. Amen. Right? Slave, Scythian, Jew, free, male, female, white, black, and everything in between. God came to pay the penalty for your sin and for mine. <coughs> for God so loved the world that He gave God so loves the world that He gave us the universe and everything in it. God so loves the world that He reaches down into the mud of creation and forms us and breathes His essence and His life into us. God so loves us that He puts clothes on our back and food and our bellies and air to breathe. And God so loves the world that in the fullness of time, when we were yet sinners, when we were rolling around with the poison of sin, snake bitten, dying, God sends His Son. To pay the penalty for our sins. So that we might have eternal life. And eternal life, folks, is not just the future reality. It's not just one day we're going to sit around on clouds playing harps. Or one day we're going to sing in the sky, sit around singing kumbaya. Eternal life starts now. It starts with our relationship with Jesus Christ right now. We can live a kingdom kind of life, an eternal life, right here, right now. We can have the fruit of the Spirit, love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control right here, right now. We can roll up our sleeves and be in relationship with God and advance God's dream in the world right here, right now. So how do we respond to this? What do we do with this child in a manger that is God in the flesh? How do we live out our response to God's grace and God's love. What do we do? Well, we start by seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. We start by making His love real to the people in the world that need to know Him. We start by making God our first priority with our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. We start by accepting this invitation of salvation and walking with Jesus day after day and being filled with the Holy Spirit and sensitive to the movements of the Spirit that leads us where the Spirit wants us to go. And we start with what the early church did. The early church got lit up by the Holy Spirit. They got saved. And Paul the Apostle is going around uh, starting these churches, planting churches. And they don't know anything else to do except give everything they have. Right? They're bringing all their property and all their resources into this community, uh, this Christian community. They're giving their lives. They're giving their prayers, their presence, their gifts, their service. They're excited. They're generous. They're giving because they understand that God so loved the world. He gave. Right? That's where we get to our second verse this morning. In Corinth, which is one of the first congregations, once excited and passionate and generous, in Achaia and Macedonia, those churches are, are giving because of the example of Corinth. But something's gone wrong in Corinth. There's some division in Corinth. There's people running around acting crazy in Corinth. That, that never happens in the church, does it? And their love has waxed cold. And their generosity has fizzled out. And so Paul writes this letter. And he says, therefore, openly before the churches, show them the proof of your love 
in our reason for boasting about you. Put your money where your mouth is. The proof is in the pudding. Because the truth is, in our Christian walk, all of us at times fizzle out. Do you remember when you first understood Christmas and what it meant? Do you remember when you fir first met Jesus and the excitement and the passion you had to, to go out and win people to Christ? Maybe you still got it, I don't know. But have you ever come to a place in your spiritual life where it, it fizzled out? Where you went into a time of a valley experience? Paul calls the people to remember their first love and to remember the God who gave and to give in response to that God. Because they're taking up this collection for Jerusalem that's going to literally feed the poor, clothe the naked, and care for the sick and the dying. And Paul says, people, remember the God who gave. And give generously and freely and extravagantly because He's an extravagantly generous God. And so this Christmas season, while all the world has been running around consumed with how to put presents under the tree and going into great debt for doing it. You faithful servants of Jesus Christ have been focusing on, on the heart, the center of what God is and, and what Christmas is about. That it's not about the mistletoe and the Christmas trees and the eggnog. All those things are great and praise God for them. But Christmas is about the God who so loved the world. How are we going to respond to that? What is your response going to be? How are we going to live in a different way? And are we willing to give generously because God is giving generously? And so this Christmas, I ask today that you consider your giving. How will you respond? Will it be extravagantly? Will it be with the eyes of faith? Will it be with, with open and generous hearts that are excited and passionate about the grace of God that has been shed in your life. Because when we come down to the altar this morning and we bring our heart cards and we receive communion, I think any of us that have any kind of spiritual maturity will realize that everything we have is God's anyway. That's right. What can we really bring to God but an empty box? Because the truth is, He who gave everything came to those who gave nothing, that they could receive everything, and He could receive them. God loves you. He loves you so much that He fought through time and space to put on flesh and make His dwelling. And God loves you so much that He went to the cross for my sin and for your sin. And the only thing that we can really bring to God, ladies and gentlemen, is ourselves. God doesn't want 10%. He wants 100%. He wants you. You're the present under God's tree. You're the apple of His eye. You're the passion of His heart. So how will you respond to that? When we come to this table, it's a table of extravagant generosity. It's a table where we come first face to face with John 3.16. For God so loved the world, He gave. It's a table where we realize that the Son of Man was lifted up, was lifted up for my sin and for yours. It's an altar call every Sunday that we get to confess, repent our sins, and realize that we've fallen short of the glory of God. We get to come down and receive again the grace of Jesus Christ and to be filled and charged with an encounter with God so we can go back out into the world and make His love real to people. And today, I want to ask you to bring down those, those heart cards of your financial commitment for the following year. And the most important voice that we will ever hear in our life is the voice of the God who gave. And I don't know about you, but I want to hear that God say, well done, good and faithful servant. The Lord be